moving forward, finding solutions. This is ABC 7 News. Hi there, I'm Kristen Z. You're watching Getting Answers live on ABC 7. We ask experts your questions every day at 3 to get answers for you in real time. The new Pixar animated film, Turning Red, is prompting conversations with kids about puberty. A Bay Area doctor will be joining us to talk about how to have these conversations productively and age appropriately. Also, the U.S. government tries to track down Russian oligarchs to freeze their assets, but is San Francisco's policy with records, and public records specifically, hampering the effort? Plus, finding solutions to the homeless crisis is one focus of building a better Bay Area. One San Francisco supervisor thinks he's got a long-term solution. But first, the historic confirmation hearings of Supreme Court nominee Kentanji Brown-Jackson is underway in Washington, D.C. If confirmed, Brown-Jackson will be the first black woman on the high court. As ABC News reporter M. Wynn shows us, the hearing, as expected, has been contentious today. Breaking barriers, Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson, the nation's first black woman nominated to serve on the Supreme Court in 233 years. Now Judge Jackson facing 30 minutes of questioning from each senator on the Judiciary Committee. If all the time is used, Jackson is looking at 11 hours in one day, roughly eight more tomorrow. Republicans vow to scrutinize her record, with ranking member Chuck Grassley questioning her interpretation of the Constitution. Do the First Amendment free speech protections apply equally to conservative and liberal protesters? Yes, Senator. Senator John Cornyn pressing Jackson on her role as a public defender, representing Guantanamo Bay detainees. And Senator Josh Hawley accusing Jackson of issuing lenient sentences to defendants possessing child pornography. To which Judge Jackson had the chance to respond today, calling those cases sickening and the accusations false. As a mother and a judge who has had to deal with these cases, I was thinking that nothing could be further from the truth. Although day two and three may be the most polarizing part of the confirmation hearings, no one doubts the 51-year-old mother of two's judicial qualifications. No one questions either your academic law school credentials or your service as clerk and as federal judge. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he remains confident the Senate will confirm Judge Jackson by early April. Her confirmation won't need any Republican votes. M. Wynn, ABC News, Capitol Hill. Although it is already 6 o'clock on the East Coast, that hearing is still going on right now. So we'll take a few minutes right now to listen in. Because they're binding precedent. But there's also horizontal precedent. It, it, too, is about maintaining consistency and predictability in the rule of law. And what that means is when you are in a district, there are many judges. And if someone else in your district has handled a case that comes out or that involves the same issues and comes out in a certain way, you as the second judge have to contend with that ruling. You can't ignore the fact that there is precedent in your district that handles a case in a particular way. And with respect to the McGann case, the precedent wasn't just close, it was nearly identical. The, the Myers case involved the former White House counsel and the argument by the executive that the former White House counsel had absolute immunity uh, in, uh, with respect to a request by the legislature that she provide testimony. My case involved a former White House counsel who was claiming absolute immunity at the request of the executive in response to a legislative subpoena. In both cases, not only was the absolute immunity issue on the table, but in both cases, the same threshold issues mm -hmm. about whether or not there was jurisdiction um, in the court because the legislature had standing or didn't have standing, which, is, which was the argument that was being made. The same question about whether the court could hear a dispute between the legislature and the executive branch, all of those issues 
had previously been considered by my colleague in the district court. And he wrote an extensive, I'm talking about Judge Bates, he wrote an extensive opinion analyzing each of the issues. And so at a minimum, as the second judge dealing with these exact same issues, I had to look at what he did and decide. Was it persuasive? Did I agree? And I did. Judge Jackson, of course, if there had been a, a vertical precedent, i.e. from the Supreme Court or the circuit court that was on point to your McGann situation, yes, you would have had to follow that precedent, but there wasn't. And so you followed a, a, a reasoning by another district judge that made a lot of sense to me, and that certainly makes sense to me. You discussed stereo decisis and the importance of precedent in your opinion, and this is what you wrote, quote, it is interesting to note that the doctrine of stare decisis performs a limiting function that reflects the foundational principles that undergird the federal government's tripartite constitutional system. This is because deciding a legal issue anew each time that same question is presented without any reference to what has been done before nudges a court outside of its established domain of saying what the law is and into the realm of legislating what the law should be. I know that you've been asked the, the questions about the importance of precedent before, but maybe you can just tell us one more time why precedent is important in our judicial system. Thank you, Senator. Our judicial system is one that is designed to uphold the rule of law. Unlike other systems in other societies, some other societies, we believe that we have a government of laws and not men, and yet there are men and women who are acting as judges in the context of our system. What precedent does is ensure that there's consistency across mm -hmm. the different individuals who are tasked with the solemn responsibility of interpreting the law. It ensures that mm -hmm. there's public confidence that the law is what is guiding judges in their decision making and not just their own individual views. And so it's, it's crucial for uh, maintaining public confidence, maintaining stability in the law, establishing a system that has predictability in it, all of which supports confidence in the judiciary, which, which is the currency of, of the judicial branch. Right. You've been watching the live confirmation hearings from Washington, Kentonji Brown Jackson, President Biden's nominee to take over the seat being vacated by Justice Breyer, who will be retiring at the end of this term. ABC News and ABC7 will, of course, continue to cover this process until the vote. All right. Um, we want to just give you a quick note that we were going to have a conversation with San Francisco Supervisor um, Rafael Mendelman about his proposal, a place for all requiring the city to be able to offer every single person experiencing homelessness a place to sleep, a shelter. However, um, he is engaged in a vote right now at this very moment, and that's been delayed. So uh, we'll have that conversation another time. We'll take a short break and be right back with more conversations. considers whether or not there's been reliance on that precedent, and, and if so, how much. Um, the court considers whether or not the precedent is workable. Sometimes uh, the court will issue a ruling in a case, and it turns out that it's not actually functioning in the way that the court intended.
Welcome. Welcome back. ABC 7 News is excited about our partnership with the digital news site, the San Francisco Standard. The Standard's focus on hyper-local quality of life issues aligns with ABC 7's efforts to build a better Bay Area. Today, in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine, the Standard is looking at the global effort to track down the hidden wealth of Russian oligarchs. Governments around the world are searching for mansions, yachts, bank accounts linked to Vladimir Putin and his supporters. But those searches are hitting a wall in San Francisco. You might even say a paywall. Here to talk about what's happening is the editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Standard, Jonathan Weber. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Kristen. Oh, it was a pleasure. So your investigative reporter, Matt Smith, did an eye-opening piece. Uh, it's on your website today, looking at whether San Francisco's approach to allowing access to public records is making it hard to identify Russian assets in the city. Uh, so let's start with this. Do we think there's quite a bit of Russian oligarch wealth hidden here? Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, San Francisco is a major center of money laundering, identified by the federal government as one of the uh, most desired locations for money laundering. Um, uh, the reasons for that are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, luxury apartments, luxury properties of various kinds are, are a very popular target for uh, concealing wealth, and there's certainly plenty of that around here. So. Uh, yes, there is a lot of uh, a lot of ill-gotten uh, wealth in property, especially around San Francisco. Okay, so if that's the case, especially if it's properties, what kinds of city records may be available that could shed light on which assets may actually be owned by Putin supporters? Well, the the core records when it comes to property are, are essentially the property records that are uh, held by the assessor recorder's office. Um, all properties are documented. Transactions relating to those properties are documented, and those uh, those records are held by the assessor recorder. Uh, if reporters or, or citizen investigators can have proper access to those records, they can uh, investigate in various ways who owns what and and find. Uh, with, with luck can, can identify uh, where uh, criminals have assets. Okay, so what is the process through this particular assessor's office to get them? Uh, you know, is it online? Do you have to go there? Is it free? Do you pay? How does it work here? Yeah, so, well, ju just to kind of set the baseline, so in, um, in New York, for example, or Miami, which are also big centers of money laundering, uh, the, the, these kinds of records are available online in a database for free, and you can just go online and search the records. Um, in San Francisco, uh, you have to request individual records, uh, specific records about specific properties. You have to put in requests for those records, and uh, those will be produced at the cost of $3 a page, and uh, one, you know, one building could have, you know, dozens of pages of records associated with it. So you could be, you know, essentially paying hundreds of dollars just to kind of look at one property record. Uh, and there's also no way to really search the database uh, online. Uh, now, the other thing you can do is go down to physically go down to the uh, recorder's office and, and use their terminal to look around. So that that's the other option. I mean, uh, but, it seems you know, this, obvious how this approach poses a problem if you're trying to, you know, link any of these properties to, to Russian oligarchs. But, you know, is any of this, I guess, illegal or violating any rules in the way the assessor's office does this? Uh, well, that, that's a point of, of contention. Uh, the, the assessor's office uh, asserts that, that what they're doing is in compliance with, uh, with state law. Uh, the state has fairly strong public records laws, but there's a lot of nuance to them, and uh, and they claim that they're in compliance with the law. Uh, we we do not believe that's the case. Uh, our legal counsel advises that that he believes uh, that this is not uh, in compliance with law, and so we'll see where that goes. Uh, by the way, when you pay that, do you pay the city or do you pay a different party? Where does that money go? Yeah, it actually goes to a third-party contractor. So the uh, the city has kind of farmed out the management and access to these records uh, to a third-party vendor, and and that's by the way sort of strangely, but that's part of why they claim that they have to have these high fees because the fees are set by the vendor and it's out of their hands. 
which doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Okay. Now, you mentioned that this is sort of an outlier, at least compared to New York. I don't know about other big cities where um, this might be an issue, but is there any reason to think that the city is intentionally creating hurdles, or do you think it's just an old system that needs updating? Uh, well, that, that's actually a good question that I don't, I don't really know the answer to. Um, I think part of it is probably habit, but there have been efforts to change this over the years, and there's been a lot of resistance to it. Um, Supervisor Aaron Peskin said he's going to bring something up uh, today, actually, at the Board of Supervisors, Supervisors meeting uh, to, to address this problem. Um, but yeah, it's it's unclear why the why the city has been so uncooperative on this. Um, but you know, if if I could add, you know, the, this problem of lack of access to, to records uh, is not just an assessor recorder problem. I mean, they, we run into this problem with many city agencies uh, where compliance with uh, public records laws are just very spotty at best. So you mentioned the standard is trying to compel the release of searchable property records. How is that coming along? Uh, well, uh, I guess not that well so far because <laughs> we still don't have them. Uh, but we'll, you know, we'll see what the next steps are here. Okay. And any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, they've just kind of explained in different ways that they think they're complying with the law and they don't want to do what we're asking. All right. Well, Jonathan Weber, thank you so much for explaining this fascinating story uh, to our viewers. Jonathan Weber, editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Standard. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. We also have links to the Standard's other original reporting on our website, abc7news.com. And to watch more ABC7 segments featuring the San Francisco Standard's city-focused journalism, check out our ABC7 Bay Area streaming TV app and scroll down to the SF Standard shelf. Coming up, you know the film Turning Red. Well, it's prompted a lot of conversations about puberty. How to talk to your kids about it when we come back. The new Pixar animated film, Turning Red, is a hit with critics and fans for its refreshingly honest look at puberty and finding oneself. But it also has some critics, parents who are worried about exposing their children to concepts like getting your period, being attracted to boys, or rebelling against parents. It's gonna be me. Ah! Is everything okay? This happened already? What did you say? So in the film, 13-year-old Chinese-Canadian girl Mei Li struggles with growing up and the curse and blessing 
of turning into a red panda when her emotions run wild. Joining us now to talk about the conversation the film raises is the CEO of birth control delivery company, Pandia Health, Dr. Sophia Yen. Dr. Yen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here. All right, well, I, I want to ask you, look, you know, some parents are just uh, delighted that puberty is a theme in the film. I just saw this a couple days ago, and, and I thought it to be just a joy. Um, but others are worried, though, what do you think about these issues surrounding puberty being front and center in a film like this? I think that it's really important to realize that this is a Disney Pixar movie. So it's adorable, it's cute, it's cartoony, it doesn't touch really the topic of periods, though it is one of the best quick, like three second discussion where they throw down some pain meds, vitamin B12, warm packs, and all these different types of maxi pads that women have to go through. Though I did notice they omitted tampons, which is my pet peeve, particularly with Asians, Blacks, Latinas, not using um, tampons as much as Caucasians do. And I think it's a great way to open up this discussion, prepare your young people for this discussion and normalize this discussion. Well, what do you think is the potential harm when these conversations are not happening when they are not normalized, if you will, and the kids don't talk about it before it happens to them. <laughs> so I do think the red panda is a great analogy or euphemism for puberty in that it's this change and she gets stinky and she's embarrassed about it. And the parents are like, oh no, we didn't think it was gonna happen this soon. And it's like, yeah. Puberty adrenarchy, which is the start of stinky armpits and potentially hair, starts at eight. Periods start on average in the United States at 12, 12 and a half, but some young people may start at 10. And so for this movie to show her, quote, puberty starting at 13 is actually when we work her up for delayed puberty. So there should have been many signs before 13 years of age that puberty was going to hit. So I, I think it's really important to discuss it because particularly with periods, and again, this movie was not about periods, it was about stinkiness and interest in boys and the separation of you know, your own individuality from your parents. But um, if you don't talk to a young person who might have periods, when they get it, they actually think they're dying or something's wrong with them. So mm. please, please talk to your young person. Wow. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, kids could potentially get their periods really early, like, you know, nine or maybe even eight. So how do you even begin to talk to a kid that age? I guess at different ages, you would have a different type of conversation, maybe go a little deeper into it, more layered. So kind of walk us through what's appropriate for each age group. Yes, so what I really love, and this was about a Canadian young girl, is they have sex ed starting as a kindergartner, and they have it every two years. Even in liberal California, we only have it like around fourth or fifth grade, and then maybe around seventh or eighth grade, and then one more time in high school. But at least we get it in before most young people will have their period. So if you have an eight-year-old, you know, especially if you just have a uterus and you bleed, don't hide your menstrual products. It's a natural thing. Just like they watched you pee and poo and wipe yourself, let them know that once a month you have a bleed and these are the things that happen. And when this happens to you, when you get older, it's just natural and normal. So it's really important to talk about it, prepare, normalize it. And I love that California passed a law that I believe starting in September, all public schools have to carry free menstrual products. Yes. As I like to say, yeah. yes, they didn't Wherever have that when I was a toilet kid in paper. <laughs> There should be free menstrual products because otherwise we with uteri are just going to take the toilet paper and turn it into a menstrual product and it's not going to be pretty. My public service announcement I want to put out there, though, is that the number one cause of missed school and work under the age of 25 in the U.S. of A, not just third world countries, but our country, is painful and heavy periods. So mm. some people, because it runs in their family, they're like, oh, it runs in my family. It's normal. Mm. Uh-uh. If you are missing school or work because your periods are horrible or your periods are just painful, 
please see a doctor and know that we can help you with that. Even if it, quote, runs in your family, you yeah. don't have to suffer. Yeah. By the way, this is not just about periods, right? Because May was also embarrassed about her feelings for Boy, that convenience store clerk that she dismissed like the day before. And suddenly she was like, what's going on? And she's drawing lovey-dovey <laughs> pictures of them. And, and all those are things that should be part of that conversation, right? Um, but I want to ask you, though, one thing I hear parents talking about, they wonder, you know, when you talk about these difficult things, right, whether it's sex, drugs, your body changing or suicide, um, they might put ideas in your head in such a way that they'd be more likely to try those things. True or false? What do we know about that? I always believe that knowledge is power. And if you give people, you know, the benefits and the cons of every situation, then they will see it. Like one thing I like is the sexually transmitted infection disease manual. Look, you don't use a condom, this happens. You don't use prevention when you're having sexual relations, you get a baby. And this is a screaming, crying baby that you have to breastfeed every two to three hours and change its diapers. And that will be your responsibility from now until you die. So it's putting out those realities and talking about sex has never been shown to cause sex. And in fact, comprehensive sex ed, such as we have in California, has prevented sexually transmitted infections and prevented unplanned pregnancy. So don't be afraid to talk about this, but if you don't feel comfortable, there are great um, resources out there. We have Health Connected, a nonprofit in the Bay Area that teaches comprehensive sex ed, Planned wow. Parenthood, All right. and then we'll another We'll have to continue that conversation over on Facebook Live, but Dr. Sophia Yen with Pandia Health, thank you so much for all that wonderful information. We'll be right back. We should let folks know, by the way, that Turning Red is a Pixar film, and Pixar and ABC7 are owned by the Walt Disney Company. Uh, but Dr. Yen, I want to ask you, you know, like, um, when it comes to tampons, you mentioned there was kind of a cultural angle, or even just the conversations about periods. I was happy to see that in this film, um, May's mom, who is Chinese Canadian, uh, she was the one who was running to her, going, "Are you getting your period?" I mean, she was just turning into a panda. Nothing, nothing, no big deal. She was not actually getting her period, but that was what her no. mom thought, and you know, she was rushing the products to school, and she, I mean, she was very open about it. I think that's very unusual. I still think we are in the "don't ask, don't tell" phase. And it's really important and lovely and supportive that they highlighted this is a positive way to support your daughter. The mom um, packed some extra snacks, gave her some tea. And again, for any parents that are concerned, this movie is not about periods. This movie is about puberty and the red panda is just a hilarious, you know, science fiction, comical situation representing emotions and just the weirdness, awkwardness of being a teenager. If you remember back to those days, you know, thinking that everyone's looking at you, but no one's looking no at one you. No one is, okay. Because yeah, <laughs> back then we can only think from our pers perspective and it's a little narcissistic, fr quite frankly. Nobody is paying attention to you. Um, okay, so lastly, look, if you're watching a film and this comes up, it's a great conversation starter, but if, you know, but if they're not, how do you start that conversation? How can you tell if they're ready? Like, how do you kind of approach it? Well, definitely if you see physical changes, as I mentioned, um, breast buds usually precede uh, your first period by two years. So if the average period is 12, then you would expect to see breast buds at 10. But if you see breast buds on your young person at eight, then you're going to have to have that period talk within the next two years. Ah. Your pediatrician should yeah. also facilitate this and right. that we will notice things and we right. will kick you out and have some private time right. with the teenager. Well, thank you again. Dr. Yen, great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on this interactive show, Getting Answers. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream, answering your questions. World News Tonight with David Muir is coming up next. Have a great day.